commemorated throughout the world for ultimately what the Greek nation did beginning with this date in 1940. So without further ado, my good friend, I, I present to you now, uh, I pass to you the Zoom platform to, uh, have, a, to have you uh, present and we look forward to your comments. Oh, and by the way, uh, if you have questions and answers, please use the function at the bottom of your screens as always to submit your, uh, your questions. Dear Mr. Chairman, dear Nick, thank you very much for these um, kind words, for this kind introduction. As you said, we, we go a long way back and uh, I want to commend you for your leadership and for the stellar work that you're doing with AHI and uh, for the promotion of uh, Greek-American relationship and friendship and, and also uh, for Greece's uh, just cause. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is a distinct honor uh, to be with us, to be with you today to commemorate this very important day um, in this battle for freedom against totalitarianism, as, as Nick said. By 1940, most of Europe was already drawn into war. Nazi Germany had invaded Poland on September 1st of 1939. Britain and France subsequently declared war against Germany on September 3rd, and Germany eventually would occupy most of continental Europe. And together with Italy and Japan, they would form the Axis Alliance that would draw most of the world into the war. World War II became a global war that lasted until 1945, and it was the deadliest conflict in the history of humanity. The fatalities reached from 70 to 85 million people, most of them civilians. Tens of millions of people died due to genocides, the Holocaust, starvation, massacres, and disease. In the wake of the war and the defeat of the Axis powers, the Allied powers would occupy Germany and Japan and would conduct for the first time war crime tribunals for the German and Japanese leadership. Greece was eventually drawn into the war after the Italian invasion of October 28th, 1940 that we celebrate today. When the war was over, 800,000 Greek soldiers and citizens had perished. Greece had lost more than 10% of its population of 7 million people at the time. It was a huge and disproportionate price that the small nation chose to pay in defense of freedom and democracy. At the outbreak of the war, Ioannis Metaxas, the then prime minister of Greece, sought to maintain a position of neutrality. Mussolini, however, thought that he would match the early successes of Hitler's Germany by attacking Greece, a country he regarded as an easy opponent. Italy had already started its provocations against Greece on August 15, 1940 our religious holiday, when an Italian submarine torpedoed Italy, the Greek destroyer in the island of Tinos. The Greek, the Greek government at the time, and Metaxas personally, despite the overwhelming evidence pointing to Italy, he downplayed the attack in an effort to stay out of the war. But in the early hours of October 28th of 1940, the Italian ambassador to Greece, Emanuele Grazie, presented Metaxas with an ultimatum. Greece would either surrender or face a war. Metaxas responded to the Italian ambassador in French. Allo, c'est la guerre. Then it is war, said Metaxas. The mobilization of the Greek armed forces was swift and efficient. In eight days, most of our army units had taken their position in the front lines. But the Greek people, they reacted to the outbreak of the war with enthusiasm, with passion, even jubilation. Yorgos Theotokas, a leading Greek intellectual of the 30th generation, would eloquently describe what was happening in Athens. Young people are running around, singing in the streets, waving flags and laurels. People participate, clapping, cheering, and singing. You can sense the enthusiasm, the passion, the bravery, and the sense of unity. 
That's what was happening in Athens. Young people were preparing to go to war, cheering with a smile in their face. It is this smile that Sofia Vembo, the emblematic Greek singer of the war, would make to a beautiful and powerful song. But it was not just the men going to war. The women would play a pivotal role in this, a pivotal role in this war. The women of Epirus, the women of Pindos, would carry 80 pounds packs of supplies and ammunition up in the steep mountains to the front line. They would shovel snow to clear the roads for the Greek soldiers and the mules with the heavy equipment. They would knit warm clothes and socks for the soldiers. They would become volunteer nurses in hospitals. They would fight in battle next to the men, especially in the Battle of Crete. The Greek women did everything and more. But Greece's intellectual elite was also present and very pivotal for the war. Greek poet Odysseus Elitis transformed his war experience into poignant verses extolling humanity's struggle for freedom in a powerful poem named Heroic and Elegiac Song for the lost second lieutenant of the Albanian campaign. Now the dream in the blood throbs more swiftly. The thrust, the truest moment of the world rings out, liberty. Greeks saw the way in the darkness, liberty. For you, the eyes of the sun shall fill with tears of joy, wrote Elitis in this powerful poem. Elitis would eventually win the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1979. And the Swedish Academy named the poem as one of his greatest works, saying that it has kept its position as an expression of the Greeks' indomitable spirit of resistance. Ostis Palamas, our national poet, who was, who was nominated several times for the Nobel Prize, would ask the young generation to rise to the occasion and emulate the founders of the Greek Revolution, of the Greek War of Independence. Palamas died in February 27th of 1943, and the funeral turned to a massive demonstration of 100,000 people against the Nazi occupation. Roused by the verses of another of Greece's leading poets, Angelos Sikilianos, sound the trumpets, the whole of Greece rests in this coffin, said Sikilianos. And the crowd started shouting, long live liberty, turning the Palamas funeral to a major resistance event in occupied Athens. But other poets, Ritsus and so many others, would write po powerful poems capturing the sanctity of the fight of democracy and liberty against totalitarianism. Because it was only the pen of the great poets that could express what was happening in the mind of the Greek people that made them unfold the, the finest traits of the Greek character, philotimo, bravery, love for freedom, dignity, disregard for death. Because after all, the balance of forces was overwhelmingly against Greece. No one at the time believed that Greece stood a chance against Mussolini's forces. The Italian forces stationed in occupied Albania at 5.30 on the morning of October 28, 1940, even hours before the expiration of the ultimatum given by Grazi to Metaxas, invaded the Greek border. The main thrust of the Italian attack was directed at Pindus towards Ioannina. And the Italians initially managed to cross the Kalamaz River and make some progress. Outgunned and outnumbered, the Greeks fought valiantly. The Greek army, under the command of General Alexandros Papagos, managed to halt the initial Italian advance into Greece in a matter of days. On November 14, 1940, it was the turn of Greek forces to go on the offensive. Within three weeks, Greek territory was clear of the invaders, and the Greek forces were in Albania liberating Koritsa, Argyrokastro, Premeti, Agiu Saranda. After weeks of war, the Italians tried to launch a full-scale counterattack 
across the entire front on March 9, 1941, which despite their superiority in armor, it failed miserably. The Greek victory over Italy was in essence the first setback of the Axis forces and the first victory of the Allies in this great war. The Albanian campaign, as it was called, was indeed an epic. The Greeks had surprised everyone with their courage and their determination. As Churchill would note later in his war memoir, summing up the Albanian campaign, I quote, the Greek army under General Papagos showed superior skill in mountain warfare, outmaneuvering and outflanking their enemy. By the end of the year, their prowess had forced the Italians 30 miles behind the Albanian frontier along the whole front. For several months, 27 Italian divisions were pinned in Albania by 16 Greek divisions. The remarkable Greek resistance did much to hearten the other Balkan countries and Mussolini's prestige sunk low. When Italy was defeated, of course, Hitler's Germany decided to come to the rescue. The German forces would invade Greece on April 6th from Albania, Bulgaria, and Hungary. And the Greeks, having heroically turned back the Italians earlier, supported by limited British forces, could not respond similarly to the overwhelming might of the German invaders. Greece would fall eventually by early June after a last heroic and particularly bloody battle in Crete. Britain would remain alone at the time in the war, albeit only for a while. Hitler would launch an invasion of the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941, that would draw the Soviets into the war. And eventually, on December 7, 1941, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States would enter the war. The United States had until then tried to remain neutral, although on March 11th of 1941, the Roosevelt administration had passed the Land Lease Act, a bill that intended to provide aid to the nations resisting the aggression of the Axis forces, namely Britain and Greece at the time. Now, this first defeat of the Axis powers changed the course of war. Until then, the Allies had only suffered major defeats. The French defense line, the famous Maginot line, had collapsed in a matter of days. Trench warfare was a thing of the past and was not a match for the mechanized armored warfare tactics introduced by the Nazis. The British had withdrawn their troops from the French front and eventually managed to evacuate almost all of their forces from Dunkirk, leaving behind, however, most of their weaponry. The withdrawal and the evacuation saved the British army and Britain would be able to resist German aggression in the fight of England that was about to begin. The Greeks, however, outnumbered and poorly equipped had proved that the Axis forces were not invincible. But the Greek resistance had another tangible consequence. The Greeks had managed to hold down the Axis for 216 days before they, were, before they became eventually occupied. And that delayed the German forces from launching their attack against the Soviet Union, driving them into the midst of the ferocious Soviet winter that would contribute to their eventual defeat. The valor of the Greeks earned them unprecedented praise and respect from many great world leaders. Roosevelt would say that when the entire world had lost all hope, the Greek people dared to question the invincibility of the German monster, raising against it the proud spirit of freedom. Winston Churchill would say that if there had not been the virtue and the courage of the Greeks, we do not know what the outcome of the Second World War would have been. Hence, we shall not say that Greeks fight like heroes, but that heroes fight like Greeks. But it was not, it was, it was not just the bravery. Military and political leaders recognized that the Greek resistance, those 216 days, 
would be a game changer in the war because the, 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 the Greek forces delay the invasion of the Soviet Union and would upset Hitler's plans. Field Marshal Alan Brook of the British Army, critical of Churchill's decision to commit British forces on the Greek side after the Italian invasion, would come to accept that the Italian, that the, the delay of the German invasion in the Soviet Union caused by the Greek resistance came to cost Germany the war. Another British general, Harold Alexander, will also state in 1941, a year after the Orchid Day, that it would not be an overstatement to say that Greece has upset all German plans by delaying the invasion of the Soviet Union for seven weeks, for six weeks. Even Anthony Eden, Minister of War and Foreign Minister from 1940 to 1942, and later Prime Minister of Britain, will recognize in a speech in the British Parliament in 1942 that Greece not only gave a lesson to Mussolini, but, get, but kept the Germans on mainland Greece and Crete for six weeks, upsetting the German plans and altering the German course of war. Joseph Stalin would accept that the Greeks changed the course of war. He said that we thank the Greek people whose resistance decided the Second World War. You fought an armed and won, small against big. You gave us time to defend ourselves. Would, Stalin would say, referring to the Greek resistance. Greece's self-sacrifice was appreciated by its friends and allies at the time and was respected by its enemies. Because in the darkest hour of the war, it was a ray of light and hope. The Greek struggle and the victory against Italy brought jubilation even across the Atlantic. People and civil society in America would mobilize to help Greece. Frank Sinatra would give his first concert at Madison Square Garden to raise funds for the war effort in Greece. But more importantly, the Ohi Day, the Albanian campaign, the Greek resistance against German occupation, the contributions of the Greek armed forces that escaped German capture and fled to the Middle East to continue fighting on the side of the Allies, brought about a turning point, a turning point in the relations between Greece and the United States and the status of the Greek immigrants in America. The Greek American community numbered approximately 350,000 people at the time, and several more thousands that had not been recorded in the national census taken that year. During the previous decades, Greek Americans were faced with intense pressures to assimilate and even discrimination. That all would change after the war. There was a newfound, stronger appreciation of both modern Greece and Greek Americans on the part of the American public and the American government. The news that the Greek people had gone enthusiastically into war against fascist Italy and won was greeted with enthusiasm and respect in the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, today is a day of remembrance, a day that we kneel with respect in commemorating the epic battle of our ancestors that they gave for freedom liberty and democracy. It is a day to draw lessons from this fight for freedom against tyranny, for democracy against totalitarianism, especially today that the dark clouds of authoritarianism are looming once again in our horizon. The memory of the atrocities of totalitarianism, the memory of the cost of appeasement, the memory of the fight of freedom against democracy, should be the roadmap to our future. Konstantinos Tsatsos, the former president of the Greek Republic and one of Greece's leading intellectuals, first spoke of the lessons of this epic battle of the Second World War to his students on the first commemoration of the Ochi Day in the amphitheater of the University of Athens in occupied Athens. Greece, he said, 
is situated in the frontier of Western civilization. It was often attacked, occupied, and even at times almost destined to perish as a nation. And yet it would rise again from its ashes to start the national life to a new destiny. This is what is going to happen again, he told them. The achievements of those who died in the front, of those that came back blind, without hands or feet, give you the honor and the duty to go forward. Your generation should be conscious and cognizant of its destiny and the political mission placed upon it by history. Your duty is the survival of our nation and the realization of a new political order based on freedom and social justice. If you do not succeed, then all that was achieved in this worthy fight will be lost. Satsos was fired the next day from the university by the occupation government, but his advice was not wasted. The war generation of Greeks would create, after a bloody civil war, a much more prosperous and secure and democratic Greece. The able leadership of the West after the war would create the institutional order that we have come to call the liberal order, that gave us 70 years of unprecedented stability, prosperity, democracy, and peace. And this is the legacy of the Orchidee. This is the legacy of the war and the fight of freedom and democracy against totalitarianism. And Greece was on the right side of history in this worthy global fight, bearer of the very ideals of liberty and democracy that its ancient civilization gave birth to. As a British, as a British author wrote once, history with its flickering lamp stumbles along the trail of the past, trying to reconstruct its scenes, to revive its echoes and kindle with pale gleams the passion of former days. What is, what is the word of all this? The only guide to people is their conscience. The only seal to their memory is the rectitude and the sincerity of their actions. It is very imprudent, he said, to walk in life without this seal because we are so often mocked by the failure of our hopes and the upsetting of our calculations. But with this sealed, however the fates may play, we march always in the ranks of honor. Ladies and gentlemen, the Greeks of this war generation, with this seal of their conscience and the rectitude and the sincerity of their actions and their love for liberty, marched into the ranks of eternal honor and worthiness. This was Greece's finest hour. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Costa, for that excellent presentation today, in which you hit on so many different uh, points regarding the uh, heroic efforts of, of Greece and what people were said at the time and the effects uh, of the country, and of course, the effects of the war itself. I remind our audience, we still have time for Q&A, and I would uh, suggest that you please use the, uh, as I said, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens to uh, submit your question, and we will ask of them to our speaker here today. Of course, let me begin, and this is something, you know, I've stated to all speakers every time we have one of these presentations, and it's very frustrating for me, because of all the things that you said, as it relates to, you know, to what Greece's heroic efforts did, uh, a small nation defeating a power like you know the Italians and then ultimately withholding holding on as best as they could for over 200 days when other countries were falling you know in hours and days and in some cases there was just you know the Nazis were just walking in uh, why hasn't Greece got a better uh, history hasn't recorded better in the west in western history and you know and you you've been in academic institutions your whole life and many here in the United States. I have never seen more than maybe just a byline regarding Greece's efforts in World War II in any of the history books that I, you know, that I, you know, that I read 
or uh, courses that I took uh, that, that, that reflect on World War II throughout my academic career. But you have been in the academic uh, world almost your entire life. Uh, why, why Greece doesn't get more uh, attention regarding their heroic efforts and what they did in World War II? I mean, you know, you mentioned Dunkirk. There's been at least two movies, maybe three movies in Hollywood made on Dunkirk, which is an all adulterated failure on behalf of, you know, you know, the Brits at the time. But there's never been a movie made, for example, on the heroic efforts of Greece in World War II. And God knows there's probably been maybe hundreds, if not more, movies made on World War II. Can you answer that? Well, I think that's, that's a very valid point. And um, as I mentioned in the beginning, it was not that um, a small nation state like Greece uh, took part in the war. Many other did so. Uh, but it is the, the price that Greece paid. Greece lost almost 10% of its population. Not only in the, uh, in the Albanian campaign, but also during the uh, resistance uh, years in the, uh, under the German occupation. Um, so many uh, Greek people died of famine in uh, the streets of Athens and other cities of Greece. And, and Greece uh, offered not only the first victory for the Allies, but a very strong resistance movement uh, that pinned down many German divisions throughout the war in Greece. Greek forces also participated in the rest of the war. Um, most of the Greek army fled to uh, the Middle East and uh, would organize uh, together in the Allies and, and would fight soldier to soldier in uh, El Alamein, in Rimini, in all the major battlefields of the war. Um, and and it, it was not the first time that, was, that Greece was on the right side of history, uh, let me remind. Uh, our, our friends, um, and, and, and also um, the, the ideas of freedom and liberty that um, the modern Greek nation was a bearer of during this, this uh, epic battle. Uh, it, it, it is not only you know, uh, the bearer of our ideals that stem out of our ancient civilization, but the valiant effort of the modern Greek state to stay true uh, to these principles of liberty, freedom, justice, and democracy. Um, and and uh, let me just give you another number, another detail that um, uh, proportionately and, uh, and in terms of percentages, the only other countries that paid uh, a bigger price than Greece during the war was the Soviet Union that lost uh, um, only uh, something like 14% uh, of its population. 20 million people, I believe it was, right? Yes. If you take it in, uh, in uh, exact numbers, it, it, is, it is a huge number. Uh, uh, in terms of percentage, proportionally, analogically, it was 14% uh, while we lost 10%. And the Poles, the Poles lost about 16%. So Greece was up there. Greece paid a very dear price. Now, to answer your question after uh, those details, I would say that uh, uh, we have not been able to, to tell our story. We have not been able to, um, um, to present our, um, our uh, part of history uh, as effectively as others have done. Uh, we have not been as successful in um, the so-called uh, ideological hegemony when it comes to the narrative of history. Uh, and, and this is something that, um, uh, you know, we can blame many factors, but we can also blame ourselves. Well, uh, it's, I've heard that before, but although I understand you got to take responsibility for your own actions to, and, and in promoting your, you know, what you do to, uh, and in this case, what Greece did, but you would still think there would be enough, you know, recognition from the rest of the world, regardless of what Greece does to, uh, you know, publicize this or to try to create this, you know, this image, uh, you would still think there would be enough. I mean, the quotes you read from uh, Winston Churchill, you know, from the Germans, you know, from the Americans, from the Congress, and all the efforts that took place in the United States during that time for war relief, led by, of course, the order of HEPA. Right. Talked about Frank Sinatra. Hollywood was very involved, and yet Hollywood to this day has never felt as involved as it was for the war relief of the Greeks to put together a proper, you know, a, a, 
movie regarding this particular uh, this issue. But uh, again, it, it's a pet peeve of mine and one that I will continue to, you know, to uh, try to resonate as much as possible. Uh, I mean, just to give you a little bit of a sidebar and for the audience, and maybe you, some of them may have heard me say this before, I had an opportunity uh, to take a tour of Normandy in France a number of years back, went there with my daughter and I wanted to pay homage uh, and pay my respects to where so many people died for the freedoms you know, that we celebrate today. And then while going there, the, the tour guide was uh, uh, giving us various vignettes regarding World War II. And she talks about how the first victory of World War II was Al Alamein and, uh, and Midway. And I kind of you know, got up out of my seat, you know, kind of woke up. I was kind of a little bit of in a stupor. And then when I went and uh, approached her at the end of the, uh, when we had a, a rest stop, and I said, well, you know, I heard what you said, but, you know, have you heard what the Greek nation did where we celebrate a national holiday called Lucky Day and the defeat of fascist, uh, of fascist Italy? And she goes, oh, yes, yes, you're right, you're right. But she never came back on and to address the issue and to correct herself. The point is, uh, you know, it's up to us, as you say, uh, and it's something we need to continue, uh, in my opinion, to fight for and to make sure that Greece continues to get, you know, uh, what it deserves in terms of the credit it deserves uh, regarding World War II, uh, where a small nation did so much to change the, the course of that, that, that war, which ultimately changed world history. But and if I may add something, Nick, on that, um, I... I quoted um, Konstantin Tsatsos uh, saying that Greece is in the uh, frontier of the uh, Western civilization. And, and we, have, we have seen that in so many historical occasions. Even today, Greece is in the frontier of the West. Um, and um, look at the, um, uh, the improvement in uh, Greek American relations that were always strong, but now I think are at their best point. Uh, and I think part of that has to do with the recognition that the, even in this new geopolitical situation, Greece remains a frontier state for the West. Greece was always a frontier state for the West. And I think that we should, we should do a better job in, 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 in so-called promoting um, the importance of our geopolitical position and the fact that we, are the most, we have been the most reliable allies of the, uh, of the West, of the United States, of, um, the, uh, of, of Europeans and so on and so forth. And I think we should uh, never cease to point out that Greece has been a staunchest ally uh, of the United States and the Western forces. Um, and, 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 and shares the same values of liberty, freedom, democracy. This is the most important thing. It's not only about common interests, but it's also about sharing common values. And I think this is the point we need to be making all the time. No, you're absolutely correct. And you see this more and more, at least as it relates to the, the US-Greek relationship, which as you say, and everyone will agree on both sides of the Atlantic, that this is uh, the golden era, frankly, of US-Greek relations. We saw recently here the Foreign Minister Dendias of Greece come and visit Washington, where he signed a very important mutual defense cooperation agreement with uh, Secretary uh, of State Anthony Blinken, uh, which commits even further to, the, to, to, to this relationship uh, and, in a much more uh, in-depth way uh, moving forward. So these are very important developments. Uh, but of course, we're always you know, quick to point out here at the American Atlantic Institute that's, you know, that nonetheless, uh, Turkey continues to be the provocateur in, in the area. Uh, Greece's sovereignty continues to be threatened by this NATO ally. And this is a NATO ally where, as you said, Greece was on the side of Western interests and U.S. interests in all major campaigns throughout the 20th century and the 21st century thus far. Turkey was not. And, and within their neutrality in World War II, uh, were actually aiding and abetting uh, the Nazis, as stated by Albert Speer in his book Inside the Third Reich, where he they were providing raw materials such as chromium, which is very important to the war, war armaments. And uh, Speer writes that because of Turkey, the war was extended by approximately another six months. Well, I also make the claim then that every, every battlefield death and every concentration death can be 
put right on the doorstep of Turkey back in, in, in 1946, 40, uh, 45, 44, 45, regarding those actions. Uh, whereas, and, you know, Greece obviously did what we just uh, discussed here today. And, and, and two additional points, exactly uh, uh, following up on what you said, uh, let's not forget that Turkey was the evasive neutral throughout the war. Exactly. Uh, and, 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 and another point um, that has to do with um, Greece's geopolitical importance. If you read the correspondence between Churchill and his generals, you will see the importance of uh, Crete and Suda Bay even in those times, because it would control all the Mediterranean sea lanes and so on and so forth. Um, right. and, and of course, this is of, of immense geopolitical importance if, even today. So it's, it's all about uh, uh, promoting, pointing out to the importance of our geopolitical position, to the fact that we are there whenever um, the, um, the situation arose and that we've been reliable and uh, uh, solid allies of, uh, of, of the West. We need to um, do that all the time, very much like you've been doing in Washington for all these years. Well, thank you. And as you say, it's not always about a quid pro pro when it comes to Greece. Right. They, they adhere to their, uh, their, their principles, their morals, the rule of law, international law, and they take uh, their, their obligations and, uh, and international treaties and international organizations very importantly. Uh, and uh, like I said, they don't ask for something in return to do something that they should under these various uh, treaties and other institutions that they're involved in. But moving on a little bit now regarding uh, the topic of today, you mentioned something, uh, you mentioned the word famine, uh, which I'm, I'm not sure how many people really know about the cause and effect regarding the Greek nation. And of all those deaths that you mentioned, how, ma how many of those were probably attributed specifically to the famine? And maybe you can tell us why did that take place? Uh, and, and how did that compare to the rest of occupied Europe? Uh, were the Germans practicing this kind of famine practice with other countries, or this was exclusively done only in Greece? And, and, and how were they doing it? I think that the German occupation was particularly harsh um, in Greece. Uh, um, one of the things had to do with the um, fierce resistance that they faced after the war. Um, and, and they believed that they had to respond in kind and there were retributions and they, uh, and they killed the entire villages. Uh, we know what happened in Calabria and, and, and other places. So the Germans were particularly harsh. Um, and, and it was not only the famine. The, the Germans uh, looted our national treasure. Um, it, it was a particularly harsh occupation. And, and, and Greece paid a very dear price economically, not only in, in human lives, but economically, um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and of course, the, uh, uh, the Allies and the Americans realized that. And then besides the geopolitical concerns, there were also the uh, human concerns that um, uh, raised all this humanitarian effort through UNRWA. And then, uh, of course, we had the uh, German Doctor and the Marshall Fund and all the funds that would uh, help uh, Greece in its role to recovery and reconstruction. But the German uh, in invasion and occupation was particularly harsh in Greece. Um, uh, and, and, and it had all this, uh, it, it amounted to, 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 to this tremendous loss of life. Most of it uh, uh, civilian, uh, had to do with, with civilians, citizens, uh, civilian population. We have a couple of questions here. Uh, Ambassador Patrick Theros, uh, writes this, and maybe you can, you know, comment on it. He says uh, he believes that the Greek left tried to downplay the Greek achievement because it would have meant giving Metaxas credit. Uh, do you agree uh, regarding uh, this? What would you What would you say? Look. Um, the Metaxas question is always a thorny question in Greece because you know the the. Um, the we had a dictate, the dictatorship in Greece. Um, the Tarti Augusto, uh, August 4th, uh, there was, uh, it was a fascist regime. Uh, there's no question about that. However, um, we have to credit Metaxas with two things. 
uh, Metaxas was um, got most of his military education in, in Germany. And, um, but despite the fact, uh, despite that fact, um, and despite the fact that he tried to uh, maintain the neutrality and not enter the war, once the critical situation arose, we got to credit him with two, uh, with two things. First one, that he had prepared the Greek armed forces to the extent that uh, the Greek nation, small Greek nation state could, could prepare its armed forces. Um, and, and, and this is why the, uh, the Greek mobilization, the mobilization of the Greek military units was swift and efficient. Um, it was estimated that it would take two weeks to three weeks to, uh, for the military units to go to the uh, front line. It took them only eight days. So he had made uh, a, a efficient and effective preparations for the war. And the second thing is that um, um, he, he said, we are going to war. Uh, despite his uh, uh, ideological affinity with the Axis forces, he uh, did the right thing. And, uh, and of course, the, um, um, the, the left um, likes to say, and uh, to, to an extent this is correct, as I pointed out, that uh, this was the, uh, the Greek resistance came out of, of, of a, a sentiment that was felt among the Greek population. And this is why um, the Greeks um, uh, reacted to the outbreak of the war with such enthusiasm and such passion because um, their love for liberty uh, just uh, burst in, in those days. Um, but as I said, um, you cannot take away uh, from a taxes uh, two things that um, he had made an up preparation of the, uh, of the Greek military forces, the Greek armed forces. And secondly, that uh, uh, when push came to serve, um, he stood at the right side of history. You haven't said that. Uh... So you believe that at that moment in time, the Greek armed forces were about as ready and capable as they could be under the parameters of the Greek state. Under, under the circumstances, right. They were not a match for the, uh, uh, for the militarized Axis powers uh, uh, that were um, very much superior, far superior in, in armor and, and units. Um, the Italian units in the front line were almost double the size of our Greek units. And also, um, we, they, the Italians um, deployed about 27 military uh, uh, units when we uh, deployed only 13. So we were vastly outnumbered. And of course, uh, the, um, when the um, German invasion came, uh, uh, it was a, 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 a terrible mismatch, David against Goliath. Uh, the um, the um, mechanized, the arm of mechanized warfare that the Germans had introduced um, was uh, a formidable war machine that uh, he had occupied most of Europe in a matter of days. I mean, look at France. France was a great power at the time. Uh, but France collapsed in, 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 a, in two or three weeks. Uh, France had uh, surrendered in, in a month. Um, and so imagine uh, what happened to, uh, to small Greece. Um, let, let us re remember that um, um, at the time, Britain committed a few British forces, but it still did, uh, on the side of, 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 uh, of Greece. And some proud um, New Zealanders and Australians would also fight along, our, uh, along the side of the, of the Greek forces. But Greeks were vastly outnumbered. They, um, did, not, they did not have air power. Uh, they did very, very little. And, and, uh, and, and of course, in terms of ammunition and armor, they, they lagged far behind. Um, so it was just pure uh, valiant. It was just pure valor. Uh, it was uh, the heart and the mind and the soul uh, that, that made the difference. Well, that wouldn't be the first or last time in Greek history where geography, I would venture to say, and certainly as we reminded of the three hardened Spartans and what they did just a few uh, years prior to that. It's in our DNA, I guess. Um, we have some more questions here. Uh, Churchill says, Church, uh, didn't Churchill's blockade of Greece contribute to the famine? I'm not familiar with this. Is this something you're familiar with? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I, I, I think that um, 
um, being in a war and, and a world war, uh, this was uh, a problem to begin with. But I think it was only made worse by uh, the German occupation. That, that, uh, that was, I think, the main factor for that. Somebody wants to know uh, about post-World uh, War II and the Greek Civil War, and why did it begin? Well, that's the um, $64 million question. Uh, uh, look, I mean, uh, the, what happened in Greece after the war was that um, the most of the um, the Italian the the Greek forces the Greek armed forces uh, fled to the Middle East to continue the war and together the the leadership and the uh, would form the government in exile in uh, in, uh, in Cairo. Um, what happened, however, was that there was a resistance. Uh, that started in the um, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the war, and to a large extent, this resistance, uh, Elas, Eam in the beginning, um, was uh, organized by by the left. Um, in the beginning, the um, the left had managed to hide its identity so that it can make an all-inclusive and draw as many people in, in the ranks of the resistance as possible. But in, eventually, when um, the war was coming to an end, um, the left and the resistance in an effort to, uh, to assume power uh, in, in post-war Greece. And of course, that, um, that uh, made things, uh, um, that made the civil war inevitable for two reasons. Number one, that the, in the global scale and in, in the global theater, um, we had um, we, we had the um, uh, um, the Moscow Agreement and um, and the, the great powers um, almost had decided the spheres of influence and and Greece would remain in the Western sphere of influence, whereas uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia would fall under the uh, Soviet influence. But also um, the, um, the, the return of the government in exile and the armed forces and so on and so forth uh, would, would, uh, would create um, uh, an inevitability of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the civil war because as I said before, the, the left um, tried to manipulate resistance in, in its effort to, uh, to, uh, to, to rise to power. Um, in Greece and, and have a leftist uh, regime uh, established in, uh, in, in post-war Greece. So, you know, that, um, that tit for tat uh, uh, almost made a civil war inevitable. And that was another bloody struggle for, um, uh, for Greece to suffer and go through. Uh, that left a very deep scar in, um, in Greek society. And it took us decades to overcome uh, the, the, the scars of this, uh, of this national tragedy uh, of the Civil War. First, uh, I read uh, somewhere, I can't remember where, that you mentioned, of course, the, you know, the resistance was very fierce uh, in Greece, which tied down many divisions. But I seem to have read somewhere between uh, Yugoslavia's resistance, the partisans there, and of course the Greek resistance, the Germans had to keep so many divisions uh, in the Balkans that ultimately could have been used for uh, D-Day uh, and were not part of that particular invasion by the Allies. And again, there's some claim there that if those divisions were there, it may have changed certain elements although I'm not sure ultimately it would have made a difference, but any comment on that in terms of the importance of all these divisions that were uh, tied down in the Balkans? I think, I, I think it, it was very important. I think the partisans too in Yugoslavia um, uh, fought their own valiant fight against the, uh, the Germans. And they, um, together with the Greeks, pinned down many German divisions. This is entirely true. Um, and, and those divisions would stay in the Balkans um, until the end of the war. Um, and the, the, the Yugoslavs uh, also 
uh, managed to liberate themselves uh, without the support of, um, of the Red Army that uh, was advancing at the time to, um, towards the Balkans and, the, uh, and Eastern Europe. And that was one of the reasons that um, Yugoslavia, in the post-war um, balance of power, maintained its independence, and especially after the uh, Tito-Stalin split in 1948, uh, managed to go um, 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 to become independent and join the uh, um, the movement of uh, independent states. Um, uh, so it, it was an extremely important. Um, it was it played a, a large factor uh, when you are involved in a, in, a, in a world war, and you are forced to um, have some of your units pinned down in a secondary uh, front. Uh, that that has uh, that has a strategic cost. That has a military cost. So this is what happened to Germany. Um, uh, Germany had to uh, devote uh, a disproportionate amount of units in the um, in the Balkans, especially because of the Greek resistance and the uh, and the resistance of the Yugoslav partisans. Uh, this is entirely true. Let me uh, ask. Uh, we have a, one last question here. I'm not exactly sure where it's going. I'm not this familiar with this particular. Uh, question in terms of its implication, but nonetheless, I want to be fair. Why the Greek resistance, which was praised so much and recognized in the 1980s? And also, the, he goes on to write to, to, to ask the question Should Greece celebrate the Liberation Day as in all Europe instead of Oiki Day? This, is, this has been a, a subject of discussion. Uh, why do we? Um... Uh, uh, celebrate the uh, outbreak of the war and not uh, Liberation Day. And, and I think uh, one main reason has to do with the fact um, that um, uh, for us, um, uh, what um, followed after the war was um, particularly dramatic as, uh, as a society, as a nation, as a state. Um, the civil, the ensuing civil war, I think, was a traumatic period in our history. And this is why we, we celebrate the outbreak of the war. Um, we celebrate the, um, the Orchid Day because it, the Albanian campaign, um, uh, it, it came to be called an epic, and it was, for all intents and purposes, an epic. It was a valiant struggle. And it was the very, the, uh, the very first victory of the Allies in this great war. And, I, and, and to make a long story short, and, and, and uh, to this, an answer to this question, I think it is because of the, um, uh, of, the, of the trauma, of the national trauma that the Civil War brought upon us, um, that we choose to celebrate the outbreak of the war rather than the, uh, uh, the end of the war, because for us, it was, there was no end to the war. Uh, it was just the beginning of the Civil War. Well, and also be more simple-minded in my own mind, the reason why we celebrate birthdays as well, <laughs> the beginning. <laughs> uh, look, here at the American Atlantic Institute, we take great pride in trying to advance the U.S.-Greek relationship and, and doing so, try to promote what Greece provides for U.S. and Western allied interests in the Eastern Mediterranean. As, uh, as uh, U.S. Ambassador to Greece, Jeffrey Pied, I believe was the one who really coined the phrase pillar of stability, for peace and stability is Greece. And we certainly agree to that. And today, it's a relationship that exists on, on interests, for and foremost, for both countries, but on values. And that's not to say those same elements exist with every relationship. And we believe in that, and we continue to promote that to the best of our abilities uh, regarding the role of Greece in the projection of US interests and Western interests in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and what Greece did in World War II, uh, is something again that we at the Institute have taken great pride in terms of, you know, we talk, ancient Greece is always going to be there, but modern Greece has a significant role that is played, and that needs to be better understood as well, which is why here over the years we've, we've uh, allocated resources and time to uh, three conferences on the subject matter and no fewer than four books regarding Greece's contributions in World War II. 
uh, including uh, the Truman Doctrine. And I, as I always like to do, uh, before we close out one of these sessions, I'd like to read a passage from the back cover of one of our books here on a conference we had on Greece's pivotal role in World War II and its importance to the USA today. Uh, that was many years ago, but it's still valid today, and I'll read this. But before I do, I want to I want to thank you, uh, Professor, my good friend, Constantina uh, Vanyatopoulos, for this excellent presentation here today. Uh, you touched on so many different uh, areas that we have not done so in having this uh, subject matter uh, discussed in the past, and, and we thank you for you know for being here and for your vast knowledge uh, on the subject matter. So I want to thank you once again. Uh, for taking the time and to, and to be with us. Well, thank you for your kind invitation. And it was an honor to uh, share my thoughts on this uh, very important uh, historical day, uh, um, commemorating the, uh, this uh, valiant fight for freedom and democracy. Thank and you. before I, I conclude, thank you again, Costa. Uh, I want to thank our newest uh, addition to the American Hellenic Institute, Dimo Theophanopoulos, uh, who is... Uh, now take it over uh, for Emily Pantis uh, in handling our production of these uh, Zoom presentations. And we welcome him here. He's been with us for a couple of weeks and is doing tremendous work. And of course, we can't host events at the Institute without the help and support of our friends and, 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 and supporters and for the sponsors of this particular program today. Let me conclude by, as I said, reading uh, the passage from the back cover of, of this book because it's very pertinent. As the years pass, it becomes more and more necessary to recall and record for new generations just how the people of Greece, alone or with allies, gained and held for their country for a century and more the independence and democracy it possesses today, and how in one special moment in history, Greece at heavy cost and sacrifice, and with great courage and determination, played a pivotal role in World War II in defying the forces of tyranny and Axis aggression that were arrayed against not only Greece, but the whole of Western civilization. It's an inspiring story. And this was said by General Andrew J. Goodpaster, at the time USA retired, former Supreme Commander of NATO. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we thank you for tuning in today to help us commemorate this very important date in history, in Greek history and war history. And we look forward to uh, having you join us again at a future AHI uh, presentation. Have a good afternoon, a good day. Thank you.